Good afternoon and welcome to this Trinity P3 webinar. Um, it is The title is In the Face of Such Major Disruption, Why is it Time to Innovate or Die? My name is Darren Woolley. I'm the CEO of Trinity P3 Marketing Management Consultants. Before we get started, I just want to cover off some housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is starting now. It'll run for one hour and finish at 5 p.m. Eastern summertime. Uh, questions will, you can ask via the Q&A function and uh, that allows you to ask questions anonymously if you wish. We are recording this session and it will be available on the Trinity P3 website under webinars in the next 24 hours for you to review uh, and also share with others. So thank you again for uh, joining us. I'd like to, uh, and it's with uh, great delight that I introduce Dr. Lee Steiger. And it's because Lee and I go back a number of years. In fact, he's been very uh, generous in, in inviting me and encouraging me to share my experience and knowledge with his EMBAs, executive MBA students at the Sydney Business School, University of Wollongong for a number of years. But uh, Lee's experience goes back more than 20 years. We won't say how many more, but uh, more than 20 years of industrial experience in business evolution and new product development. Uh, Lee's managed many new product development uh, and supply chain projects in sectors including aerospace, uh, medical devices, automotive and environmental. He particularly has a passion for helping small to medium sized companies achieve their next stage of growth. In addition to this uh, knowledge around innovation and management, Lee's recognized as a creative and strategic thinker. He's also a chartered engineer and a chartered scientist. And as I've said, he's been the uh, director of the executive MBA at Sydney Business School, University of Wollongong for the past 14 years, but he's also the owner of Tiger Bay Consulting, which undertakes activities in business system design, educational process design, and industry education to leading manufacturers and educational institutions. He's also, God, you're so busy, Lee. A director yeah. of a number of tech businesses, or what can we call them startups? They're, no, you, we can't actually. We can call them uh, second stage, but the, these guys have, have got a bit of product now, and that, that's where we've got to. So, not your classic bean bag and gunner. These, these are good Aussie businesses doing something. Well, look, anyway, please welcome Dr. Lee Steiger. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I am doing smuggling, as they used to say in the old country, doing okay indeed. We live in interesting times, and between you and me and everybody listening in, I think I was born to social isolation. I love it. I can get down and do some stuff. It's forcing me to do stuff other ways, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually really enjoying it. I've never been healthier, never been better, and never been more energised. So it's a part of your, it appeals to your introvert, the introverted part of your character. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think that's okay. You know, we talk about diversity in so many ways, but some of us just just prefer the office by ourselves, if that makes sense. <laughs> well, look, it's good to hear that you're well, because obviously a lot of people are not well. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The pandemic has had a huge impact on business, where it's created a huge amount of uncertainty economically. We've got major trading partners that have been uh, disrupted. You know, there's there's some words that the media love, and I know, you know you'll take me to task on this, but you know, it's an unprecedented uh, year, and we're all pivoting, trying to work out what the new normal is. Now, if we had a green room, I promised you that while we were in the green room, I was going to slap you if you said pivoting. Now you're going to have to show the ladies and gentlemen what pivoting really means, which is go around on okay. that chair. On us. I, but pivoting, agile, all of these words are they're, they're baggage words when you're not doing stuff. Um, you've got to change. Change is inevitable. Get into all of the, the consultancy speaker around that. Unprecedented, maybe. Um, the thing we're, we're not really addressing, and you know, here, here we go off camera and off script, is the fact that the unprecedented here is that our once strong global supply chains are now on their knees. We have seen times where 
there has been a hiatus or a complete breakdown in supply. We are seeing times now where there's this thing called nationalistic supply, where we're looking to bring stuff home um, and do it ourselves. And the Aussie government are, are starting to look into this. There's also something on the horizon called sovereign supply, if you've come across that, which is we need to keep some capability in Australia in case this should ever happen again. But, you know, be it bird flu, be it black death, Spanish flu, be it GFC or whatever, it's not unprecedented, it's just the next one. I think it's affected an awful lot more of all types of business and all types of community. And I think this is the one that caught us out because you know when one was up, another one was down and so on. But I don't think there's a business or a household anywhere in, in Oz that's um, not been affected by this one way or another, where we've not been forced to, to change the way we, we think and do. Um, you and I have spent many a coffee and many a breakfast um, kicking around Sydney, talking like old folks do and putting the worlds to rights. But over the last nine months, what have we done? We've done that through phone, we've done that through Zoom. Um, is it better? Is it worse? It's just different. And different I think it's yeah. Adapted, you know? So, yeah, it's unprecedented in many ways, but, you know, same old for, for, um, for the rest. I was chatting to a mate of mine last night, and I think this is my fifth rodeo where people have gone it, it's you know it, it's 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 doom and gloom as, as we see it and when we kicked off a little while ago um I, I did a piece for you in terms of being pessimistically optimistic and that's exactly where where we're at you know you can be terrified and excited all at the same time what do we know that tomorrow most certainly is not going to be the same as today yeah it is interesting because of the dual components, isn't it? There's been a pandemic which has very clear personal health risks for all, you know, for everyone. I don't think there's anyone that can escape the anxiety around that. The second part, and you mentioned it before, you know, it was only uh, 12, 13 years ago that we had a global financial crisis. Uh, outside of Australia, it's just called the global recession, but uh, in Australia, we call it a financial crisis which we're going through now in a way it's a, it was caused by a different reason but mm -hmm. you know we've now got an economy that's uh, had negative growth it had phenomenal negative growth in the first quarter you know, the first quarter of the pandemic but the other part is that it impacted businesses differently it's not like uniformly every business was suffering from cash flow crisis because there were some businesses that in some ways benefited from the situation, you know, we just have to look at the retailers, the food, especially around food supply, um, toilet paper, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But but you know, compared <laughs> to yeah, compared to airlines, which you know had massive disruption, laying off you know tens of thousands of staff members in this country alone. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's not uniform, is it? because a lot of recessions, everyone's impacted by the cash shortage. Yeah, and I, I think it's the cash shortage. I think it's the freeing up of cash um, and a, a questioning of what are you gonna spend your money on? So, you know, even, even with myself, my normal working clothes, as you know, something different to, to face off against you today. I bought a new suit for, for the beginning of the season, like I, I always do. It's still in its wrapper, this, this kind of thing. And um, we, we question, or I think we've all changed our, our spend patterns, which means that even predictable markets where you go, okay, we're gonna sell 15 crates of, of, of X, suddenly turn out you sell 73 crates of Y that you know before the pandemic you you, you thought were were basically written off stock. It, it's been been very interesting times and there, there's a thousand different lessons to learn from it. But um, I, I think going back all of that time to, to GFC and you know GFC there's managers out there now that can't remember GFC they were were still in school while it was was happening. But I, I think there was a significant amount we could and should have learned from GFC. And I think, you know, the, the segue that we're setting ourselves up for here is that, that slide. But I, I think 
if we, we look at what happened with GFC and the change in markets and the regrowth, then it provides us with a bit of strategic over the horizon sight that we, we would not have had without GFC. Um, so even GFC is now a bit of a blessing to, to help us deal with, with, with this pandemic and with, with this crisis. Um, and I, I think as well with, with GFC, we assumed we would get back to normal with markets quickly, and it never did. Um, you know, we, we will forever look at 2020 as the, the, the time it all came crashing down, the non-year, the year we wish we for, should forget. But if we step back the year before, we had all of the crisis around those, those disastrous bushfires on, on the lead up to, to Christmas and so on, we, we then before that were actually moving in to a significant slowdown. And we can't use the R word because, you know, interest rates were dropping through the floor. We were being paid to take on credit and, and so on in, in certain areas. But, you know, we, we were certainly heading there in, in gay abandon. Um, and then thankfully GFC came along and kind of hit a lot of that. And we had, had something to, to kind of blame on, on our troubles and woes. So we were heading for an, another great free fall as, as we, we got with the GFC. And in some respects, I'm hoping that people are, are kind of more prepared or, or that little bit more optimistic than, than we would have been back then. Now, what you're um, uh, referring to before was uh, dip dynamics, wasn't yeah, it? This was the, came out of the GFC, but it's actually quite uh, a valuable uh, map, I guess, of ways of responding to uh, financial crises, isn't it? Look, it is, and it's a bit of an insight. Let, let's not lose um, sight here that we're, we're supposed to be talking about innovation and, and how we excite markets and so on. Um, but it starts with that dip dynamics piece. And if you want to put it on the screen, I'm happy to talk you through it and um, then what the implications are. Okay, there we go. Okay, now this, this actually forms part of a, a whole bunch of um, ideas and postulations. And there's actually a bit of deep research in there as well. Um, but starting over on, on the left hand, hand side, um, if we consider businesses to be ecosystems. You know, this concept of supply, one to two to three to four, is quite archaic now. Um, and if, if the pandemic has taught us anything, this idea around, you know, we're all supporting each other and if one bit of us fails, then the, the rest of the, the supply goes down. So you, you've got this square ecosystem and the, the shapes are, are just shapes. Um, you're happily doing your business all day, every day. Um, and, you know, you're working at 100% capacity. Now, it doesn't mean 100% efficiency. You know, it still means somebody hasn't turned up for work. It still means there's a, an odd thing happening here. You're left with some stock there. You know, it, there's, there's stuff that goes on in all businesses. But it's just another day in the office. It's just another day in the warehouse, the, the shop or whatever. And then something happens. And with GFC all of that time ago, um, the best story I heard was a, a large organization I'm describing what happened and they were happily doing business on the Wednesday. Phones were ringing, they were taking orders and, and so on. And then on the Thursday, the phones weren't ringing. So they, they rang Telstra and they went, oh, the phones aren't working. Sorry, the phones aren't ringing. And then Telstra went, yeah, that's right, your phones aren't ringing. And they said, but our phones need to ring. We need to take the orders, we're a very important business. You, and, and so on, make the phones ring. And Telstra said, we can't make the phones ring. He said, well, we'll pay you a lot of money, make the phones ring. He said, no, no. Um, let, let's explain a bit more. There's nothing wrong with the lines. There's nothing wrong with the phones. It's just that nobody's phoning you. And, and almost overnight, this, this company had gone through, you know, 100% of the sorts of things they were doing, just, just a normal day. And they, they got into this, this drop zone or, or this, this free fall. Now, when we were monitoring it at the time, uh, business leaders at the time go, oh, we're a bit down, you know, it, it's 5%, it's 10% or whatever. And as we got deeper and deeper in, into GFC, 50% um, was, was normal, 60, 70, 80% in, in some organizations and they, they were still surviving. So what happens next? Well, of course you, you have to, to recut your, your cloth of, of your business to, to suit the, um, the marketplace you're in. So you know, the, the redundancies, the cutting backs, the, 
the lack of future orders and, and there was a, a time where where everything just went flat that there was no business being done and you know th this was was covered by this idea that there was no confidence in the market therefore money wasn't being lent and it was, it's a lot more complex than, than that um that that simple description but but fundamentally stocks were being cleared that there, there were bits and pieces going on but but it, it was flat and it was very scary because you, you didn't know when you're going to come out of it um then you got this this kind of bullwhipple squiggly line piece where we we thought that you know business was picking up and historically when we analyze this now it, it seems that there are a lot of spotting orders little filling gaps um, if you had zero business one day and the next day you took an order, then clearly your, your sales were up 100% overnight and, and this kind of thing. So it, it was a very insecure, very rough time in, in the market. And then this is where um, the, the real impact in, in the longer term happened, which is when markets got stronger, when things started to um, improve. And our observers in the world and our business analysts were telling us we were going to see exponential growth. But of course, that wasn't the case. There was a lot more trepidation. Um, it's, you, can, you can cut businesses quite quickly, um, but to regrow them from a, a near sort of standing start takes time. You've got to build capital, you've got to get expertise in, you, you, you've got to do all of the, um, the, the stuff that, that's taken you years in the past to, to grow. So instead of seeing this, this exponential growth, it was growth bit by bit, growth reluctantly. Um, I suppose ever more witnessed in terms of um, the job market itself became more contract and casual as opposed to being fixed um, and, and into the future. So there, there was this, this massive mismatch between what we thought economic growth should look like and, and what businesses were really doing. And the moral of the story was that over, over the period of, of whatever the, um, the downturn was that the business's ecosystem, if you like, changed from a square to a triangle. What they ended up with was a very different business, although seemingly packaged in the, the same wrapper or brand. And um, the dynamics, the structure, the ecosystem, the way they engaged with themselves, importantly, the way they engaged with their customers and indeed their customer requirements changed dramatically. And um, this was the whole thing with with GFC. Now, if we have a look at what's what's been happening with with pandemics, well, of course we had a similar sort of thing. You know, one one day Qantas were flying, the next day Qantas were not flying. One day we were on Sydney trains, the next day we're not on Sydney trains, um, and so on and so forth. One day we're allowed out, and we 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 can go to to the local cafe. The next day we're not allowed out at, at all, and, and so on and so forth. And then it came back, it went away, it came back. We're hopeful that we're, we're going to see a bit of a, a growth right now, but you know, how is it going to grow? It, it, it simply cannot grow back in the, the same way it's happened because expertise, knowledge capital, um, even the working capital to, to run the business needs to be regrown again. It's going to take time. And within that period of time is where I am incredibly optimistic and excited about the future because it's that disruption is going to enable good, new or good existing businesses who are agile enough, and I promised I wouldn't use the word agile, but you know everybody seems to like it, but who are quick enough, smart enough and clever enough to take markets that they weren't able to do before. And that, that's, it's gonna happen. It, it's not gonna be the same, bring it on. It uh, sounds a bit like the misquoted uh, Charles Darwin, that survival is not for the fittest, but the most adaptable. Yeah. yeah. Because what, what you're showing here in this, uh, in, in this um, uh, description is out of a dip will come new ways of growing business. So I guess, you know, part of what we hear, part of the narrative that's going on at the moment is this constant prediction about new normal. But uh, what you're saying is to navigate this process is actually about adapting and innovating, creating new products and services that uh, actually test the new normal. Well, this is now where it gets very interesting, of course. And um, 
time time to get some some rocks thrown at myself. We've been doing what's called a longitudinal study. Me, me and my chums have been doing this this thing um, ever since GFC, and, and in truth, quite quite some time before. In terms of, if you like, innovation readiness, um, which, which sounds aw awfully sort of smart and and sweet, but it, it it's really a, a bunch of test points for for organisations around how how their, their capability, their, their competence in delivering new products to market is, you know, what, what, what the status is. And before I get on to, to a couple of numbers, I, I wanna do my usual sort of little sidetrack here and go, what this actually means in real terms on recognition that, that the market never stays the same, but is always evolving because your customer is always evolving is how how close you are to your customer and how prepared you're going to be for your customer next time around. So that it, it's not just about, can you do new product? Can you innovate? But actually how, how close you maintain step with your, with your customers. And it's, it's quite scary. So, you know, every year we've, we've run surveys and, and interviewed people and, and, and so on. And the, the data's come back that over the decade, we've seen a, a general decline. And it, it's gone from know, about 30, 35% of, of, of people undertaking this survey who actually had a new product development strategy. And last year, pre um, all of the, the pandemic -y stuff, um, it actually flatlined. Um, we, we were bouncing around 5%, 10%, which, which is not good, um, but it actually flatlined pre-COVID. So we, we can't blame COVID for the, um, for the flatlining. At the same time, there's other bits and pieces in, in the survey. And the other one then is how, who within the management team has experience of bringing new products to market? So, you know, the stuff that you and I do, every day and swing from the rafters and, and so on and enjoying how many people actually have had experience of taking a concept or a go situation and getting that product successfully into the market. And that's interesting as well because um, the most recent figures to come through, it's 5% of, of executive teams actually have real hard experience of bringing new product to market. And there's, there's lots of, um, implications of this in terms of, you know, we're outsourcing our innovation to our supply chain. Well, if that's the case, that could have been strategic. But, you know, as we kicked off with this, there ain't no supply chains in the same way that we were expecting them to be in 2019. And the 2021 supply chain is going to be very different to the stuff we were looking at in 2020. So we've outsourced to people who may not be there anymore, or because our numbers now um, deliveries of change may not want to do business with it's not before we get into international trade agreements or, or anything else. Um, oh, we need to breathe. So within Australia, we're, we're looking at a very limited experiential and strategic competence of bringing new products to market. Now, I use new product development because that's what I grew up with. You know, this thing's morphed into innovation, but what, whatever terminology you want to use with this, um, the reality is that your product is the thing that connects you to your customer. It is the thing you transact for money that keeps you in business. And if you have a low competency and a zero strategic intent in that area, it, it's got to raise some questions, hasn't it, in terms of your future viability. And as we've discussed in the past, you know, if all you're left with is cost cutting, then at some point that cost cutting just ends. You, you can't cut well, yeah. anything from anything. It's it's interestingly because uh, my business partner Michael Farmer did that the analysis of the top fifty advertisers in the U.S. and found that uh, adjusting CAGR for uh, for inflation. They were averaging around one and a half percent revenue growth mm. or income growth, um, but uh, share prices were running at a lot, I think it was ten point five percent, so ten, you know, ten times tenfold higher 
um, driven largely by M&A and, uh, mm. and, and cost cutting. So yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is that the GFC and the dip that occurred there actually uh, got us uh, to the point that people coped by cutting costs. And one of the things they gave up was innovation, new product development, new and services. I, yeah, I, th I think because it's easy to cut, it doesn't have an Im impact today on your business, but it does have an impact tomorrow and the day after, but today you're safe doing that. The thing that has always troubled me in that space is that I can understand why you would want to do that. It makes good financial sense today. But the, the big one then is that you say you're gonna cut innovation, you're gonna cut new product, you're gonna cut marketing or advertising. I heard just yesterday of a, a crazy thing where there's a company that's just cut all their sales team. So you, you know, so you, you, you're gonna cut this. Um, and what does that mean in practicality is that the thing they cut are you, the thing they cut are me, and you know, when you and I are gone, they then cut the clever people. And this, this is the thing with, with dip dynamics. If, if you remember where you're starting to see this come back. Now, you and I are reasonably easy to cut. We go reasonably quickly. It, it shows on balance sheets and all of the other bits and pieces. But, you know, we are very difficult to hire. It takes a long time to assimilate into an organization, and it takes even longer to get traction to impact back into that cycle of new product development and customer satisfaction. It just takes time. And it doesn't matter how clever you are, and you're a very clever man, it still takes time in, in, in terms of, of regrowing that. You think about the impact that has not just then on the product itself, but the supply of that product. It's not just the supply of the product, but all of, in, you know, in my world, the ancillaries, but it affects marketing and the message they're gonna um, have. It affects sales and them going out. So, so that, that knock-on effect um, fundamentally hammers all of your value creation within an organization. You know, go back to, to Porter and, and all of this sort of stuff. The stuff that gets cut is fundamentally all of the value creation. Mm -hmm. So something is going to give somewhere. And I think this is where this disruptive bit happens. Now, organizations out, out there in business land are so vulnerable to this that they're hoping that somebody like you or somebody like me doesn't come along and go, I think I like this space. I think I'll stay. Because it, at that point, it is quite easy. And you, you can go back 50 years at the historics of rapid product development and market dominance. And once you find that point of vulnerability, it is easy to claim a mistake. Now, it's not in the whole market, but it's in the market best suited to you. And that, if you like, is, is the, the point where product development ceases to be something that's done by creative people in the V cut, but actually product development is the thing that gives you your competitive edge. And we can take it. You know, you and I have made a, a career out of either making friends with people and protecting it, or making friends with other people and taking it. But but fundamentally, it, it, it is straightforward to do that at that point. We've seen this in a number of categories over the last you know, 20 years. So uh, the dairy industry in Australia consolidated. Mm -hmm. We had some big acquisitions, for, especially from Global Dairy came in and bought up a whole lot of small ones. And what rises out of it is a huge number of, you know, let's call them boutique um, dairy producers making cheeses and things like that, that started to erode the premium end of the market. I remember yogurt, for instance, you know, suddenly yogurt had been turned into a mass commodity uh, supermarket item that, you know, it was uh, decreasing in uh, cost per hundred mils. And then suddenly there was all these new boutique uh, and, and, you know, um, macrobiotic uh, yogurts that uh, that start to erode the premium end. Craft beers, you know, same again. Blessed are the cheesemakers. Now, he, he, yes. this is <laughs> absolutely um, what we're talking about with nationalistic supply chain, that we can go back to these, these boutique cheesemakers, these bu boutique beer makers, and the disruption 
people will turn around and say it's tech. You know, oh, they've gone online, they're selling direct, we're not getting out to the shops, therefore. But again, that's a simple explanation to a much more complex issue here. The, the, the tech hasn't created that disruption. It's just enabled these little guys to find those niches that the bigger guys were, were no longer interested in playing. Why? Because they've, they've driven themselves to commodity and middle ground. Now, in any marketplace, you, you, there is a lot of coin to be made in premium. There's a lot of coin to be made in cheap as chips. But the last place you ever want to play in the marketplace is that commodity middle gray ground. And yet the, the whole cutting piece with organizations drives people to be all the same. Now, what do you and I want as discerning young gents around town is that we want a bit of cheese that's a little bit different. Where's my Stilton? And if I can't get my Stilton locally, then it's easy, even for a lad like, lad like me, to go online and go, Stilton cheese, who can supply? Oh, while I'm there, I'll try some of their smoked cheese. While I'm there, I'll try something else. And all of a sudden, my, my cheese um, purchases go straight to a boutique that ships it to me whenever I press go. And um, that's another category that, that's killed in, in my local supermarket, which is pity because I quite like my local supermarket. The women in there are brilliant and they have done an incredible job over, over GFC. They haven't been recognized enough for that. But the reality is that I have now been given choice and accessibility to that market in a way that I, I would never have done before. So for people that are yeah you made a statement before that it's almost like uh, we've forgotten how to create new products yeah we have forgotten create how to innovate the services that we offer it's absolutely all all of the work we have done and it, it sounds as though it's it's sort of oz bashing or it sounds as though it, it's company bashing but the reality is yes we have and you know, it, it's ever more prevalent in, in terms of the baggage words, the pivots and the agiles and, and all of this. What, what does it mean? Okay. Yeah. You pivot, you stay the same, you just show the back of your head. Um, this stuff that we're talking about is a process like, like any other. If, if you go into ISO standards, you've got QFD and how to develop product for the customers. And it, it's all there. One to two to three to four to five and so on. Um, and unfortunately, innovation has, has taken on another kind of fad thing where, you know, leaders not experienced in it, um, who, who want to show their, their superiority to us, the, the, the workers, turn around and say, well, what we're going to do is innovate. As though what we're going to do is go to Woolies and pick up a kilo of innovation ne next to the Stilton cheese. Yeah? Um, neither is going to happen because the cheese ain't there and the half a kilo of of innovation isn't there. Innovation is a process that you have to go through, you have to follow, and it starts with understanding who your customer is. And we, we have lost the basic process of innovation or the basic process of customer focus or the basic process of value creation or the basic process of new product development within most organizations. Now, that's, that's the generalist approach with most businesses driving to the gray mediocre. There is a flip side to this, which nobody's really talking about. I've got a little list here. Where is we flatlined with those, um, those generalist businesses? And you know, they're, they're, they're organizations that you and I know. There are certain sectors that are completely the opposite. And these include defense, pharmaceutical, therapeutic goods, um, green environmental sort of organizations. And these guys are all performing at 100% where they have a clearly defined new product development strategy. They know exactly who their customer is and they know exactly what they've got to do to get there. And the, the twist in the tail, and there's some stuff we've written on this. If, if, um, if you're interested or if anybody listening in is, is interested to this, um, then let us know and we'll, we'll get you copies of, of these, these papers for a, a bit of a read. But um, the interesting thing here is that it would seem that anybody who is operating within an industry that's highly regulated is using innovation, new product development, is using that customer focus and the regulatory environment to actually compete. So they're getting better and better and better and better at innovation. 
which then says the better they become, the more world-class they become, the more world-class they become, actually the better they are at performing in a world-class uh, marketplace. And what is, um, what is G GFC or pandemic given us? But it's actually opened up global marketplaces to the more innovative. So there's a big lesson to be learned around those who are regulated, those that have a system that says that will, um, actually seem to be an awful lot more innovative than those that we, we would expect to do it because it's the right thing. It's counterintuitive, but that, that's what the, the sort of numbers are telling us at the moment. And it, it's been the same thing. If you, you look at defense, if you look at um, pharmaceuticals, therapeutic goods, these guys have consistently averaged 98% response rates to, um, to, to the, these, these questions. Now, the bit we haven't touched on, of course, is that if you, 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 you cut away the, the fluff from all of this, then all of the ISO um, family of standards, say, how are you gonna focus on customer? And um, there, there is an absolute requirement in those standards to conform, to satisfy customer, to create exciting new products driven by your customers. So we're, we're missing something and it's counterintuitive. Those that you would think would be more constrained to do this stuff are actually those who are doing more and more of it and winning. And those you would think would do it because it's gonna build brand equity and, and get customers locked in, it's the right thing to do, are those who are doing less and less of it and trying to survive on, on cost cutting. And I, I think if we, we step back and go pandemic, disruption, your square is already a triangle and it's gonna end up being a hexagon or, or something else in terms of what that marketplace is to you in the future. The only way that you're gonna get there is by developing exciting new products that delight your customer base. The challenge out there is there are very few people who now have the experience to be able to do that rapidly and successfully. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? What should organisations be doing? You know, and, and what's the and the other question is uh, particularly what is the role of the marketing approach? Because you know a lot of people are, uh, are thinking that marketing is the comms or promotions area, but in an actual fact, marketing is much broader than that, isn't it? You look, we we had enough. Um, Two ins and fro ins. Is it sales and marketing? Is it marketing and sales? What comes first? Look, um, more clever people than me, marketing, marketing triggers demand, sales triggers supply. And the, the reality is in the real world that the, these, these two work hand in glove. There is certainly not enough focus and profession um, and respect around the role of sales out there. Um, to, to the point where, you know, salespeople are almost the, the devil incarnate. And also, when you work with great marketeers, it's easy to spot the carpet baggers who fiddle around with a Pantone or, or, or something and call it marketing. But what the role is, is that they are the, the conduit, they are the connection to customer. And the best sales guys I've ever worked with have been so passionate about customer that you know, often the question arises, well, well, who are you working for, us or them? And the answer is, it's not an us or them um, in, in that kind of adversarial way. We can't survive without them and often they can't survive without us. And if it looks as though um, we're not gonna be there for them, then they're gonna have to jump ship and they're gonna have to find somewhere else to, to be able to survive. So the, the role is getting closer to customer and then actually getting closer to the organization so that that whole process of new new thing happens seamlessly and it, it happens in an enterprise fashion which is the right thing for the customer because if it's the right thing for the customer the customer will buy and if they buy there's an opportunity that they might come back and buy some more and if we can keep learning from our customers then we can keep the developing and delivering delightful products and they will keep coming back and that's the basic theory behind it and the role is if marketing and sales, or let's stick to the script, which is if marketing are doing their job properly, and I, I don't mean that in terms of they're not, but from a management point of view, if marketing 
is being allowed to do their job properly. Everything else should flow through in the way we expect it to flow through. Um, but if marketing are not being allowed to do their job properly, and if they're hampered by business cases and costs which, which are not logical in the, the process of decision making, you've got to ask what's going on in the business. Mm. And if you are a marketeer in one of those businesses, then your, your personal and professional decisions might be to um, seek more innovative and agile employers, should we say. Should we say. Well, uh, sorry, sorry, Lee, but it's interesting. Um, let's just pick uh, financial services and particularly banks, okay? Uh, sometime in the past decade, I think every CEO of the major banks has made a public commitment to become more customer centric. We then had a Royal Commission that showed that many of the practices, especially in their wealth management areas, were not particularly customer centric. But what we have seen, and you have to say that I think the combination of a pandemic and a recession, the associated recession, has seen a focus that is not just financial, but you know, we've seen the banks responding to customers' hardships in a way that is unprecedented, I'll use the word, because you know, they're seeing that they have to play the longer term. Whether they're playing the longer term because it's the social pressure, whether they're doing it because coming off the back of the, uh, the Royal Commission, this is a time that you know, they can make good for some of the, um, the sins of the past, who knows? But we, you have to say that organisations like the banks have actually become more customer responsive if not customer centric. They, they become more customer responsive publicly, but how is that rolling out practically? Mm. And you may have better data than me. I'm not seeing it necessarily as quickly as it should have happened. We're month nine, we're month 10. It, you know, we, we're, we're the thick end of a year here. Where have we seen those product and services really change? Or, or have we been holding on and giving it a, a feel good Go through the advertising and and so on, um, and I'm not sure that we've seen the innovation in the the big banks yet that they could have done in that period of time, which, which is recognised. This is never going to be the same again. You know, the casualization of a workforce, for example. How how can we now start to to assist these guys into the future? Because you know, you you may have lost your job. The chances of you getting a full-time job again, zero minus several million. The chances of you maintaining good income over several jobs, gigs, etc., cetera, um, very high. So how can we make our products and services now fit that model for you, bearing in mind that you're mostly legal, decent, honest, and truthful, and the kind of customer we want. Um, so perhaps it takes longer. Perhaps they hide behind governance. Perhaps, um, as I kind of think is probably the case with banks like so many others if you debadge them and we, we used to do debadging exercises years ago in the auto industry it's something that, that that's continued in, in consumer goods and, and a whole bunch of other places but basically you put all of the products in a white room and you take any badge off that, that, that presents brand and you then put a, a consumer group in and say well you know can you spot you know the 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 Steiger brand from from any others, and if your design features, if your brand is is well enough understood within the marketplace, it should be easy to to tell the signatures of that product without without the badge being on it. Um, and I I question truly at the moment with with the banks, if you were to de badge them, could you tell the difference? With airlines, if you debadged them pre, um, pre-COVID, could you tell the difference? Now, you know, we know the tragedy that's um, been happening with, with Qantas staff at the moment. It, it, it is, it, it is a, a terrible time in history, especially the, the 100th anniversary. Um, but there's something heartening if you drive around Sydney Airport at the moment, the way those, those aircraft are strategically positioned as a promise to their customers in, in the future. That is very clever. 
and you know it, it, it kind of makes you proud and it makes you want to go there and you know we, we should be so lucky um but the the truth was and d discuss this as, as often as I, I i could with with airlines um when you get into the tube even pre the tube if you took the badges away are you actually getting a differentiated service and that that can happen in so many ways what was great about Qantas, what I hope will come back with Qantas, is the people. You know, the, these were real people doing a real job. And it, it was just like coming home, wherever you were going. Um, and, and that was a def differentiator that the, the, these guys could have been dressed like you and me today, but they, they still have that air of Qantas because of that, that, that personal approach. Um, but often the, the, there wasn't. With, with banks, the big ones, it, it, it's tricky. Where am I going with this? In either case, be it an airline or be it a bank, the opportunity now exists for somebody to come along and take that personality at the same time they take that product. And how it's done is a little bit piece of the time. It's the areas on the fringe of a bank. It's the areas on the fringe of a supermarket is the areas on the fringe of um, an airline that any newcomer can take, make their own, and make it so difficult for somebody else to operate in that space that the big middle of the road, try to satisfy everybody organizations, simply cannot operate in anymore. Mm. And, and that's the reality. Now, where do we go? Again, you know, we're leading to something. How, how do you reinstill this? It's a process. And I, I thought long and hard about this. And, you know, we, we've been using a, an innovation process for, for eons, which has been a four step process. You know, an organization would, would, would get, um, get our group in, in in one way or another and say, you know, we, we need to solve this problem. And it's always been a four-step problem. You go in, you have a look around at what's, what's going on in your, your photo survey. You ask why, you get to a root cause of the problem. You then apply a whole bunch of principles of creative problem solving. You know, it's benchmarking, design thinking, QFD, total design entries, any, anything to actually solve that problem. And out of that comes a, a quick prototype that you know can be a scrubbled up piece of paper, something in, in terms of planning the wall or whatever. And we, we would come to a solution, that solution would be agreed, you know, we, we, we go away as, as heroes. And often that solution would actually be implemented. And then the next problem would happen and back in we go and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but more recently, and it, it's, um, it, it's starting to happen, which is that four stages now become a five stage, which is learning from feedback. So, you know, once you've implemented your, your prototype, once you've got over that, that problem, you, you then actually go through a, a whole post-mortem of, of what have you learned, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that then instills this continuous loop back through because it, it, it starts to embed and develop a capability within the people that have gone through the process in the first place. So you, you can't just... You, you cannot go to Woolies and ask for a kilo of innovation, but what you can do is, is look at the problems facing an organization, new market, new product, you know, COVID, and, Sorry, and go through a, a process of change, but embed the tools and techniques so it, it becomes a culture of change. So, so it's not, which we've seen with a number of large companies, it's not appointing a chief innovation officer to be the, uh, the, uh, vanguard the the standard bearer of change so i've folded my arms now you know um <laughs> yeah, and, th and this is why we don't seriously i had a very people. long discussion uh, only a couple of months ago by someone who is a chief innovation officer for a very large organization and i actually said well how, how do you drive innovation and they said well largely my job is to encourage collaboration across the business you know just get people together and hope magic happens yeah look i, I think if we'd have looked at this differently i i think pandemic could have given many many ceos the opportunity to, to turn around and go we are where we are we don't know what's going to happen we have got some significant challenges in front 
Um, let's start to attack these. So the first one is how we're going to make some money. The second one is what's the business going to look like in the future. Third one, and, and so on. So, so start to hack these and use the expertise within the organization to start to solve the organization's own problems. I think the, the problem so often in large and small companies is that how you go about doing that to begin with has been lost somewhere in, in the passage of time. So we, we know what we would like to do, we just don't know how to do it. So, you know, chief, chief innovation officers in terms of what they're trying to do is get collaboration is absolutely right. But if people don't know how to collaborate, if there isn't a backbone of a tool or a technique to allow that to happen, at best you get beanbags and design thinking and everybody goes away or brainstorming and you've got five black dots to put on the, the, the best idea, which ends up as the next corporate camel, um, as opposed to solving real problems with, with real solutions. Mm. You know, you can throw an awful lot of money at consultation and, and creative somethings, or you can go through a process with a defined objective at the back end, because at the front end, you set the objective. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, Lee, I'm just aware of the time and uh, we haven't got any questions at the moment. So if anyone has a question, this is the time to ask it on the Q&A function. So um, probably a more pointed question is specifically, you know, the work that you do with uh, Tiger Bay Consulting. What, what do you see as your role or function with helping organisations solve these problems? A year or two ago, I would have said sort of sanity check that, you know, we, we, we go in a, a bit of a voice of, of reason and so on. Um, we don't need to be adversarial anymore. We don't need to be anything in terms of fonts of knowledge. All we need to do in many cases is almost act as a ringmaster or a bit of a conductor while the band gets settled in, if, if that makes a, an analogy or... We, we kind of help bridge the axe as, as this thing goes through through the, the process. The, the big one over the last few years has basically been embedding a, a new product development or an innovation process within an organization, help keep tempo with that. And over a period of time, it becomes an embedded culture of innovation. And any newcomers in, you know, they, they settle into the the process any outgoers um don't go with all of the knowledge capital carried in their, their backpack um so it, it's around it's around helping keep the cogs oiled until there's sufficient capability within organizations to to self-lubricate effectively and, and that's what we do this, this is the process that's help you get it embedded this is the process, let's see what's going on. This is how, how it works. Here, here are our, our teams to, to get this, this away and so on. Um, and it, it becomes a, a self-fulfilling act in many respects. Set an objective, solve the objective, move on to the next one. And yeah, it, it's not tricky. It, it just needs time. Yeah. There's no smoke, there's no mirrors, there's no um the you know the the, the great and all, almighty oz behind the curtain here with with any of this um it just uses good principles and committed people to solve problems look um it's been a terrific conversation but we've uh the time's uh, caught up on us but uh lee thank you very much for uh coming and talking about uh the opportunities, I guess, you know, to sum it up, you know, 13 years ago, we hit a dip. For 10 years, we've been coping. Perhaps this dip is the opportunity to actually get back to driving uh, growth through new product and new services rather than uh, keep than resorting to the coping strategy we've had for the last decade. For anybody, I think, who is determined to do a bit now, then the opportunities are endless because the old bastions, the old networks, all of that has been just, just washed away. So see an opportunity 
and just work how you're going to get there. And it's incredibly exciting times I think we're about to live in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you. We'll just, uh, I'll just take everyone to the screen. Here we go. So look, uh, this uh, workshop recording will be available in the next 24 hours at trinityp3.com forward slash webinars. If you've not already, please subscribe at trinityp3.com uh, forward slash subscribe to stay up to date with all of the uh, the work and the uh, the events that we're uh, organising. Having um, mentioned that, future workshops, we have one next week, which is how to manage agency productivity and performance to drive value. And that'll be particularly interesting because uh, Exact AI, uh, who have developed a uh, AI platform that will connect an agency's various technology platforms to get rid of all that mundane work so that people can focus on adding value. And then the week after that is the why measure your carbon pollution, why measuring your carbon pollution is the first step to sustainability. So these will be the, uh, the final two in our four in the lead up to Christmas. Again, uh, you can see uh, inf information about these events at trinityp3.com business-events. I'd like to uh, thank you again, Dr. Lee Steiger, for uh, making time available and uh, coming and talking about the opportunities. And thank you very much. Thank you. And for everyone else, have a great day. Uh, if you have any needs, here's our contact details. And we look forward to uh, hearing from everyone very soon. Thanks for joining us.